Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell. I'm going to be one of your hosts here tonight at The Real Science Exchange, and I'm joined tonight with two guests that will be uh, discussing all things silage. But first, let me introduce uh, Dr. Lehman Kong from uh, the University of Delaware. Dr. Kong, welcome, and uh, since this is a virtual pub, I'm going to ask you what, what's in your glass tonight. Just iced tea. It's just iced tea. Oh, well, all right. We, we can go with that. Uh, Lehman, I'm appreciating your background there, and I believe uh, because I, kn I know your background, that's Hawaii. Is that right? <laughs> actually, I fooled you. You so did. This is, this is actually the Oregon coast. Okay. <laughs> all right. Very well. Well, I'll, use, I'll still use that. Uh, you did uh, grow up in Hawaii. So why don't you tell us about that, and how did you become uh, – involved in the dairy industry, specifically oh, silage? Oh my gosh. Um, well, let's see. Um, I did not grow up on a farm. Uh, I had a lot of pets, um, the typical urbanite that had uh, a rabbit and parakeet and tropical fish. Um, I did have a duck and a chicken. <laughs> um, and when I went to college, I obviously wanted to do something with animals. I wasn't really interested in veterinary medicine per se. I was more interested in the zoo zoology, biological part of the animals. So I, I went into an animal science department as an animal science major. Um, and really what changed my life completely were two things. One was I had a great advisor that uh, helped me get into undergraduate research. And the second thing is I randomly took a class called Tropical Dairy Production. Go figure, right? You're in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And um, I merged my interest of ruminants and cows with undergraduate research. And that's what um, got me to where I have been and am today. And it was a great experience. Um, the first silage I ever made was probably with uh, sugarcane silage, because that's what I did my thesis on. Yeah. Wow, very interesting. Well, that's a great story. Glad to have you here. I also Thank see you. that you've brought a guest with you. Would you mind introducing your guest? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, Bonnie Kowalki with us today, and um, I've known Bonnie for a couple of decades, maybe more. <laughs> Not quite sure. Um, and uh I think I first met Bonnie when she was actually with uh, Lalaman Animal Nutrition. And uh, in fact, well, I'll let, I'll let Bonnie give you her, her background. Why don't you do that, Bonnie? Okay. And I know exactly uh, our, the time frame because my son is going to be turning 18 in, mm -hmm. in just a few days. And that is exactly the, uh, I went to work for Lalaman when he was six months old. Yep. And and that's how you and I met is, is uh, we were on the, you were on the speaking circuit and I was qualified to drive you at that point. <laughs> um, and prior to that, I had, I had grown up on a dairy farm in Minnesota. Um, and back then, you know, 120 cows, milking cows was, was a large dairy um, in Minnesota, at least. And I then uh, came out to uh, go to school at Cornell, graduated from Cornell, and really felt like if I was going to be in the dairy industry, I needed to be in, in New York at that point in time. And so I uh, stayed in, um, in New York and, and uh, went to work for a regional feed mill and did diets and was on farms and, you know, all the good things that uh, nutritionists get to do with, with uh, dairy farmers. Um, I did that for eight years and then and then moved on to Lalamond and really focused on silage quality and rumen function and uh, learned from great people like um, Clay and Lehman and and uh, others. And uh, and now um, now I feel like I put all of that together and uh, really make the whole silage thing um, completely different than what we did like 20 years ago, where I think, 20 years ago, we, we uh, well, it's time to make first cutting, and now we take a much more systematic approach to it. Well, Bonnie, it's great. To, yeah, it's great to have you here this evening. I uh, want to thank you for joining us. This is a virtual pub. I'm going to ask you, uh, what's in your glass tonight? The mudslides, which 
Um, I was watching the Little League World Series uh, last week when it was raining and all those kids were going down uh, the Little League hill. And uh, all I could wonder was, how are their mothers ever going to get the mud out of their clothes? <laughs> so hence the mudslide. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very creative. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and finally, uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, my co-host and good friend, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Clay, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, what might be in your glass tonight? In my thermos tonight, I have uh, I do have some hard cider in here tonight. All right. Trying to keep it cool. That's good. I am. So, Scott, what's in your glass tonight? So, Clay, unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm out of bourbon. And uh, well, that's so not good. I'm, not, I'm not sure that's uh, a great Unacceptable. Thing. It is unacceptable. Yeah. But I, uh, I, I have what I call my forever bourbon. And so what that is, I have a, a container. And uh, when I get down to about an eighth of a bottle, I'll pour it in there. So it's it's always different, always evolving. So that's what I'm down to now. So I'm out of everything else. So, so I'm not sure what I have every, uh, in, in the glass tonight. It's kind of like that old, uh, what was that Johnny Cash song uh, about the car and the different years. That's, that's what I'm having tonight. So anyway, folks, thank you for joining us here tonight on the podcast and here's to a great one. Cheers. 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 Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit Balchem.com to learn more. Just real quick, Bonnie, tell them what the name of your uh, consulting company is. So my uh, consulting company is called STEM, S-T-E-M, Ag Consulting. And it really is to focus on um, training and education and systems in, in how, to, how to do things better. And right. STEM, does that stand for anything? So the, um, the S is for service, T is for technology. Um, e is for education and M is for management. Okay. And then do you operate your business mostly in the Northeast or are you uh, countrywide? Yeah. So I spend most of my time in New York, but I also get into Northeast Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. And occasionally uh, we'll get down to Georgia and Florida. Mm -hmm. Very well. Good. Especially in January and February. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They so have Lehman, a lot of silage problems in January and February. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Lehman, you uh, you gave a, a webinar a few weeks back on silage, and I think the topic was specific to wild yeast. We'd like to cover some of that tonight. We're going to be talking all things uh, silage. Why don't you, though, start us off by kind of talking about some of the big themes that you talked about during your webinar? Uh, sure. Um Probably the the biggest theme, well, one of the big themes was that you know wild yeast is a is in silages is an issue um, that there are different types of wild yeasts. Um, all yeasts that that are naturally found in the, well, most of the wild yeasts that are naturally found in on the plants and in silage are usually a problem because they're either going to uh, anaerobically ferment sugars to ethanol, which we don't want to do, at least when we make silage, we don't want to do that. Uh, if we want to make a good drink, that's great, but uh, not 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 for cows. Um, and then uh, aerobically, uh, these wild yeasts can uh, uh, lead to um, spoiled silages and spoiled TMRs, so that's a big problem, and we've got to be able to control them, and we, we do know how to control them. Um, we don't know specifically the mechanism of the negative effects on the animals. Um, you know, when silage is spoiled, animals eat less, but the big question is why do they eat less? Is it a toxin? Is it a smell? Is it a taste thing? Is it a, is it a combination of all those things? Uh, we're, we're not real sure, um, but we do know that when there's a lot of wild yeast in silages and TMRs that those um, silages and total mixed rations will become very unstable and heat and cause intake issues. So um, that's pretty much what we, we covered, all the nuances of that. Now, is there any things that we can do to reduce the amount of wild yeast in the silage? Uh, can you treat the fields? Um, can you treat the silage as you're harvesting it? Yeah. So, you know, 
we really can't do much to, from a treatment standpoint, understanding crop. Um, uh, you know, there's been some talk about, well, what happens if you put a fungicide on? And there's really no good research that would show that if you apply a fungicide on the standing crop, that that's going to give you improved aerobic stability when you feed the silage. Uh, so I wouldn't think about going that route. Um, the biggest thing to keep yeast populations down in the silo is really your management and things about, you know, that we talk about, that we've talked about forever, right, Bonnie? Uh, name some of them, you know. The, uh, well, probably number one would be uh, getting it harvested as quickly as possible, uh, covering when you have more than, you know, 12 hours or a rain delay. Uh, I'd also say something that you always talk about is is the importance of the moisture being um, at that ideal moisture. I, I think you've mentioned that that's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, pack density, um, feed out rate, um, having a good fermentation. I mean, you can certainly also ad use additives, right, Bonnie? To keep yeast populations yeah, down you, in the silo? Yep, you can use a, a heterolactic, uh, like a Buchneri, or there's some others now. And also um, there's acid that you can also, also use. Those would all be uh, additives that you could put on at the time of harvest. Yeah. And actually, oh, a question, you... oh, sorry. Actually, a question that, all, that usually comes up that I'm asked is, um, you know, does the amount of yeast on the plant at harvest, does that really make a difference? And, you know, from my mind that the answer is really no. And because it's what you do after with the silage and the packing and the feed out, that's really where you can make a difference. And what comes in from the field, if you do a really good job, you can stop all their growth and kill them. But if you do, if you have a really low population coming in from the field, and you do a really bad job with management, everything's going to explode on you. So the conditions in the field, they don't really contribute much to this. It's all about, it's all about what happens in the silo. I yeah, think. I mean, I would say so. I mean, you know, there, there might be it's a few oddball conditions in the field that might cause high yeast loads like bird damage or hail damage or something like that, you know, does, you know, have a lot of earworm or you know, blight. something, something, yeah, blight, something that destroys the integrity of the plant might give you a higher yeast count at the beginning. But again, uh, if you did a really good job in getting that material into the silo and packed and anaerobic and taken care of, those populations will decline naturally with time. I, I was just going to say, I think that's really the the challenge because we we talk about how you know, if you are able to do this the way that you wanted to do it, then you can get control of those yeast and, and mold populations. But just like today, um, sometimes things don't always go the way that you want them to. And I feel like on farms, there's there's hours that things work the way that you want them to. The, the packing guy is, you know, packing the way he's supposed to be. The pushing guy is pushing the way he's supposed to be. The truck drivers doing his job and all these things are are working the way that they're supposed to but so often all it takes is one one cog in that in uh, or one what is that a cog in the cog chain in the wheel. cog in the wheel, in the wheel. <laughs> take the mudslide away from me <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but my point is my i did have a point that it's so easy for things to get derailed just by one thing. And I've, and I've seen it happen where we've done a pre-harvest meeting and everybody knows what they're supposed to do. And then one person gets called away or one tractor goes down and you stop in and, and you look at it and you're like, what happened? And, and it's like, well, this one thing happened in the chain of, of events after uh, took our perfect situation into a, into a, a bit of a of a domino effect and and so i spend even though a lot of folks don't like to spend time talking about what can we do when things go wrong you don't need consultants or lehman or any of us to help you with the day that's perfect 
you're really looking at what do I do when the unexpected always happens? And, and that's where I, I think one of the things that silage quality um, really gets off to a good start is when we start with what's going to go wrong because something will. So let's say one of those cogs happened uh, and now you've got a wild yeast problem in the silage. What do you do? So uh, the first thing I guess I would do is to try to make sure that you realize what the issue is in your silo, right? Do you really have a wild yeast problem? Are the counts really high? Do you have poor aerobic stability? Um, and then you have to really pray a lot <laughs> because one of the things that happens when you have a bad silage coming out of a silo is that there's not a lot that you can do. I mean, there are some little band-aids, for example, um, you can prevent um, spoiling silage coming out of the silo. You can prevent it or, or not prevent it, but you can um, uh, slow down its spoilage in the total mix ration with a TMR saver product, right? But that's a band-aid because you didn't stop what happened before you put the TMR saver on. You're preventing it from getting worse, but you didn't stop the initial this uh, destruction from going on. So, you know, that's that's not the total answer, but it's the only thing that you can do because there's nothing that you can do to kind of go back in and retreat the silo that's high in silage and, you know, make it completely stop. So that's where, you know, we kind of pound people on the fact that you've got to take all care of all these things that Bonnie's been and I have been talking about prior to feeding, so that you don't get into that situation where you're looking at a band aid to um, to help solve a problem that's you know where there's a huge gash and it's really you know the bleeding's just not going to stop you know efficiently. So, so it's all about prevention. It's Sorry, all about Clay. Prevent. I was, yeah. I was just going to ask Bonnie. Bonnie, so uh, as a consultant. What do you do ahead of the harvest to make sure that that uh, that that farmer and that silage uh, is in a position to be able to prevent uh, uh, wild yeast infestation or or any other problems? What does that process look like, and how soon do you start? So some of the uh, that planning actually started last fall, right after harvest. You'd be surprised at how many people know exactly what they would do differently right after we've finished and so that's where i really get my notes from is after harvest we'll kind of do a download of what went right went what what went wrong and then um, about this time of year for corn silage we'll get those notes out or or if there was big things we had to do differently um we might have already been working on that this summer but then get the little details you know how many trucks are we going to need um, do we have the drivers that are coming back? Do we need to do a training meeting for everyone so everybody knows what the the uh, big you know overview plan is, and and then review you know packing, um, rate of fill, uh, how are we going to do dry matters? How are we going to evaluate fields? Who's going to be the scout? Who's going to pull the trigger on on whether we're not going to or we're we're not going to go into this field? It, it really is, uh, again, putting together a system and, and most of everything I'm saying is something that Lehman um, has taught me at some point in time. So I, I don't mean to be stealing what, what uh, Lehman has told me. Um, but the main thing is, is to have people that, that can say yes or no, and, and you empower people. And I've seen really great things happen when you empower everyone from the truck driver to, you know, the chopper guy on how fast the material is going to come in, uh, where the material is going to go. Uh, it's really fun when the truck driver starts, will will send a message to somebody and say, hey, the packing guy isn't pushing up six inch layers. He's, he's uh, pushing up too thick of layers to get our good density. So when you get it to be harvesting as a team sport, 
that's when really cool things, really cool things happen. And so everything I do prior to that is to, is to get that team sport uh, headed in the right direction. If that, if that makes sense. You know, that's a great analogy. I love that. Uh, the uh, Sorry, Lima, that, that the team sport aspect. Now, do you get those folks involved like in the fall right after the harvest again? Do you get everybody involved or is that more the managers that you're working with? So it it does depend, but what we really try and do is is right away afterwards, it's, it's kind of a download of, you know, everybody tell us what went right, what went wrong, and then we'll we'll write all that down and then and then get the managers together to address the things that that are the most important. So there might be 20 things that get written down as, you know, bullet points of what was good and what was bad, and then the managers will decide, uh, you know, what are the two or three things that we're going to focus on um, fixing for next year. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I had a, had a one of the things that I remember for that I've remembered from visiting farms, a lot of farms throughout the U.S. The one one farm I remember was on there was a a, a big bunker a pile driveover pile, and uh, there was no plastic on it at all, at all. <laughs> and you know we were we were, had the dad and the son who were the operators there, and you know we basically said, well, who's responsible for this? You know. And I just remember, I can see today, I mean, this was like 20 something years ago, I can see the face of the son looking at the dad and the dad looking at the son and both of them looking at each other and just going, <laughs> you know, where was the, you know, it's like, it wasn't me. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not my responsibility. No, it's not mine. No, it's, it's not, well, it wasn't mine. You know, and and so that's like, again, you know, the perfect example of what Bonnie's talking about, you know, someone should have had the responsibility that said, you know, no, that's your responsibility. And, you know, yeah, it blew off how many times, but then you got to fix it, right? And yeah. No, I was just going to say, for those of you that are, are not watching on YouTube, but uh, rather listening on the podcast, uh, Dr. Kong's face was much like the face uh, from the little boy on Home Alone. It looked a lot like that. Uh, that was... I was wondering, you know, assuming something did go wrong and you and you have a wild yeast issue in, in the silage, how do you determine if you have an issue? What what uh, can you test for it? What, how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. I think the most obvious thing is that if you do have a wild yeast problem, it, it, you're, you're going to see in aerobic instability, right? You're going to see heating. You might see some molding that's occurring. Um, you're going to smell it. You're going to have that kind of what I always call the the old musty sock, <laughs> gym sock yep. smell. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, those are real telltale signs that uh, something bad is happening and it's it, it probably was initiated by wild yeast. Um, you can take samples, um, right, Bonnie, from the field, but the yep. issue the issue always is, you know, getting that sample to the lab and getting the analysis back um, in a timely fashion so that that sample doesn't deteriorate um, in transit. And that's always a, a, a challenge for everybody. I mean, there's, there unfortunately is no easy on farm one minute two minute five minute test or even even an hour test on farm there's nothing on farm that you can test for the numbers of yeast it has to go to the lab and because of that in you know in the winter time it's not bad because even if it gets hung up in the mail it's, it's not bad but in the summertime if a sample gets hung up in 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 transit for two or three days uh, I can almost guarantee you that the yeast numbers at the lab do not reflect what were what was there, you know, when the sample was taken. So, and I and you know, having said that too, you know, then you know you have to ask yourself, well, if this sample is heating and spoiling and smells bad, do I really need a yeast count? Right. Uh, right. You know. Yeah. The the biggest thing that that I use is is just the difference in temperature. If if my core temperature, let's just say it's it's 80, 
and they mix the feed and, and the TMR, again, I'm just making up a number, is 85 when it gets dropped in front of the cow. Um, if I come back 12 hours later, and that is, is now 95 or 100 or 105, I know I've got a yeast problem. I don't have to send it off to the lab. I know that that, that heating issue is coming from, from um, yeast that are either growing in the corn silage or the haylage, or it could be wet brewers or, or something that, that got put into that TMR. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the, the easiest, quickest way. Yeah. Now, if I, you know, obviously if I want to send it in and find out exactly what, um, then, then you, you can do that, but you can't freeze it and you're probably better off overnighting it. And, and again, now you're looking in the rear view mirror just a little bit. Yeah. Lehman, you probably get a lot of calls uh, when things are going wrong, right? I'm sure that's when your phone starts ringing. So what would you, how would you characterize the top three problems or uh, mistakes that cause the most problems? Mm, the top three. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, in terms of aerobic instability, I, I would just say in, 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 in silage quality overall. Silage quality overall. Um, of for me, number one is probably um, extreme dry matters. So harvesting either stuff way too wet or way too dry. So, you know, getting dry matter, that's probably the number one thing. Um, number two is probably uh, pack density and covering. So I'll put those two right together. Um, and uh, I don't see it quite as often as I used to see decades ago, but number three, you know, I mean, I, I'm just trying to think here on my feet, probably is actually harvesting at, at a, you know, overly mature material, you know, that, and, and that then affecting quality from a nutritional value, um, you know, because if, if you're going to harvest corn silage at 50% dry matter. I mean, you know, that's what you got, right? I mean, <laughs> there's not much you can do to fix that. Uh, or if you've got full bloom alfalfa, um, you know, you, you it can still ferment really well and be in style perfectly, even if it's full bloom, but the feeding value is garbage, right? Mm -hmm. So from, from a silage nutritional value versus a silage fermentation value, I mean, I think we have to look at those two things a little bit separately, right? And, you know, I've always, I always try to remind people that, you know, you could have the best nutritional value of a crop standing in the field that you've ever seen in your life ready to harvest, and you could have that going into the silo, and you can completely destroy that with really bad management in the silo. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, how do you work with your uh, your producers too? And let's let's take the first one. Uh, talk about dry matter. How do you how do you determine what's the best way to determine what dry matter you want to start harvesting it at, or when it's at that right dry matter? So I will answer your question. I I'm going to ask Lehman a question first. Of those of those uh, two. Um, dry matter dry matters that you could be at you you're saying that you think the the worst is being too dry versus too wet no i'm saying if, that if, both both extremes are bad are, are bad okay are bad okay. yeah yeah i'm not trying to characterize that one is worse than the other i i would say that both are both are bad okay both have their uh -huh. their limitations you know too wet and, too and, wet too wet silages usually means uh, too much fermentation, too much wild acetic being produced with legumes, too wet silages, increases the chance of material going clostridial on you. Uh, too wet corn silage, probably you're gonna end up with intake issues because of the high acidity. And then if you're on the other side, and then, and then of course too wet, you have potential for runoff too. Uh, stuff that's too dry is you got uh, issues with packing density, You've got issues with um, pack, pack density. I'm sorry, I said that pack density, ADIN formation because of heating and heat damage protein inhalages. Um, so, 
you got, you know, it just kind of depends on, you know, you want to stay out of the extremes and stay someplace in the middle. I would, I would also add kernel processing. The, the wetter typically is easier to process. The drier it gets, sure. you better have your processor right on the money. Right, exactly. Which a lot of guys do do these yeah. days. So back to the question about, uh, you know, how to to help dairymen get to that that perfect dry matter. A, a lot of um, uh, producers are using uh, a crop management team or a crop management specialist um, that that go out and and scout the fields. Um, I also um, have uh, farms that go and do their own scouting. And, and then we'll bring back um, samples and you can use, uh, of course, the coster tester from, you know, years ago, or I know some people use the microwave. I use um, two different um, instant uh, dry matter testers now. One is the NIR for farm and the other is the SIO, uh, the SIO cup. And both of them are, are really, uh, well, they're convenient because in 30 seconds or a minute, you have have the answer to the question that you're looking for. Um, and and the second is, if you don't believe it, you you don't have to wait another hour. You can you know resample and and uh, see if you get that that number a, a second or third time. You know, in our earlier conversation, Bonnie, you had talked about uh, your use of using drones. And technology, and I'm kind of curious as to your experience with that, and where do you see that going? So, I was really excited about the future, <laughs> and I still am. Uh, during that period of time, and it was about four or five years ago, uh, the technology is there to to um, fly the drones, and with the certain kind of sensors, you can um, see how tall the crop is. And, and uh, you can look for uh, plant populations and you can look for disease. Um, there's, there's lots of agronomic things that, that that technology allow you to do. What I was more interested in uh, was towards harvest, being able to, um, to look at dry matter and looking at a whole field. Let's just say I've got a, a 20 acre field and being able to fly that and look at the vegetation and being able to determine the, the range of, of uh, dry matter or moisture in, in those plants. And then being able to, to uh, map that out and say 85% of the crop in this 20 acre field is at the optimal chopping uh, moisture, let's, let's go chop this. Instead of the way that we do it now is we go into the field and we hope we get a representative sample and we chop it and then that that uh, determines whether we we chop that field or not. What I found out was that it's very time consuming and the technology isn't quite there yet. Um, there's new sensors that are coming out that will get down below the canopy because that's really where your plant starts to dry out uh, more than than uh, it does from the top, and so. I think that in the future, that is going to be a, a great um, tool. It just isn't, um, the technology isn't quite there yet, and also the user friendliness of it. Um, the, that each field really had to be calibrated. Um, and so that works really great when you're out west and you know you have hundreds of acres in one field and, and you can calibrate and that's really easy. but um, here in the Northeast, where maybe our average field is 20 acres, um, that was just incredibly time consuming to calibrate uh, for each 20 acre field. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to living long enough to see this new technology. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, the, the, uh, the, the, the sensors that go underneath of the canopy, how are they deployed? Are these uh, are they, they wheeled type uh, machines? No, it, it, no. It's, uh, the no, it's it's right on the it's right on the uh, the drone. And again, don't okay. now you're asking me for <clears throat> okay. information. I don't even know how it works, but okay. uh, it it does go um, below the canopy, and I don't exactly know what or how. Some hmm. of that is is lidar, right, Bonnie? Is it some of yeah. the sensors? So yeah. lidar is yeah. at 
I, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but LIDAR is the, are the sensors where they've discovered, um, if you ever watch National Geographic, they've discovered um, in uh, Guatemala, Ecuador, they've discovered Mayan ruins um, mm. that were never, that they never ever knew were there. And because the LIDAR radar can actually break through the canopy of all the forests and the trees and show man-made um, structures. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a technology junkie and always, uh, you know, enamored with what's next. Do you guys have any insight into what's next beyond perhaps mm -hmm. drones or improving their capabilities? I, I think that, again, as they become more uh, user friendly and, and people get more and more comfortable with them, I mean, pe some pe people are using them now for inventory, uh, inventory management. I see us not very far away from also being able to use them for uh, flying to determine what the the uh, uh, the the yield is going to be for for volume uh, because it can tell you how you know how tall the plant is and uh, and I think that would be hugely beneficial instead of saying well I hope it all fits or we'll just go higher um, when we get above the walls which is a safety issue. Um, and uh, so I, I think that it's just going to make our decisions better and us uh, and our our uh, our folks able to um, yeah, yeah, make better decisions and more timely, timely decisions. One one other thing, um, just just as as I know that there's some farms that that fly them um, will fly the field quick um, in the spring uh, to look for wildlife. Um, I have other farms I know look for sinkholes uh, down in, in the south. So there's there's some really practical things that you can do with a drone that have has nothing to do with um, inventory or or uh, quality. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, changing uh, uh, directions just a little bit. I remember <clears throat> When I first graduated from college many, many years ago, I was working for a feed company much like you were, Bonnie, and we were selling a silage additive that contained uh, urea and molasses called LSA 100. And uh, I'm kind of curious about um, how you guys feel about adding, uh, you know, NPN in the in the form of either urea or or anhydrous or and also perhaps some sugar sources like uh, like. Um, like was in LSA 100. Who would like to handle that one? Clay, you, you act like you've heard of this one before. You're taking me back a long ways on this one. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> so I'll actually start. I actually kind of, I'm going to say I kind of grew up on uh, with clear sinuses. <laughs> because, <laughs> because of a, uh, and hydrosomonia, you know, I went to Michigan State to do my PhD, and my PhD work actually was combining anhydrous ammonia corn silage with heat-treated soybean meal. And uh, so, uh, and I remember the guys at the uh, MSU Dairy, you know, when we turned that anhydrous on, <laughs> the guys in the, on the, on the, uh, um, Factor just running as fast as he could to get away, and everybody in awe of like you know iced lines in the middle of the August and September, and all the lines icing up because of the anhydrous super cooling. And um, you know back then, uh, you know that was all precipitated for those of you who are old enough like me to remember that because of the energy crisis and the the Arab oil embargo and and. Uh, you know, that this is where anhydrous came from because of, of the, you know, all the cost of soybean meal and protein supplements was so high that they were looking for alternative sources of nitrogen that they could feed ruminants. And that's where anhydrous came from, you know, the gas super cools in a cold flow unit. And so the tank is gas, but in the cold flow unit, it changes back to a liquid and it looks it looks like sparkling water actually when mm -hmm. you look at it and um you know and back then it was great because it did increase the crude protein you know you you put on if you if you put on and if 
the anhydrous was put on correctly <laughs> and it was retained on the plant because a lot of people had the anhydrous in the wrong place so on the chopper and you'd lose I mean I know farms that lost 90 percent of what they put on it never stayed on the plant because they didn't have the applicator in the right position oh. but when they did if you put on you know four to five pounds of anhydrous per ton of uh, of corn silage, you'd, you'd increase protein from eight and a half to about 12.5 to 13. And then obviously there were some times where people over applied and you'd get stuff that was like 16 or 17, that would be a nightmare. But, you know, you'd have a, you'd almost uh, increase the crude protein content by 50% and much cheaper than putting in a couple more pounds of soybean meal. And of course, anhydrous is very antifungal and it buffers the silage as well. So fermentation is also longer. So you add an antifungal compound, fermentation is longer, you get more natural acetic. So you get all the things that kill yeast. So the great thing about anhydrous ammonia treated corn silage was that it actually was very, very stable. I mean, that stuff never spoiled mm -hmm. aerobically. Um, but in today's world, uh, you know, just from a safety factor, and I would not be messing around with anhydrous. Um, urea doesn't really do the same thing in terms of aerobic stability. It does increase N, but it doesn't really improve aerobic stability by itself. So urea is different from ammonia in that aspect. And uh, Bonnie, you wanna talk about sugars? Or... Yeah, uh, so, I think molasses was uh, one of those things that that kind of comes up every once in a while, and it, especially before um, inoculants got uh, to be, I'm going to say more more proven. Um, and the whole idea was that if we if we provide enough sugar or we provide more sugar, that fermentation is going to go very fast, and that's going to save nutrients. The downside I see with molasses is if you didn't get blessed by mother nature with the good bacteria coming in off the field, you're also gonna make the bad bacteria uh, grow that much faster with the, with the addition of molasses. So it's not a guarantee, um, kind of comes down to, or at least the way I look at it is, do you feel lucky? Um, and there are so many other uh, things that you can add these days, you know, with your homolactics or your, your combination bacterial products that, that take all the luck and and guesswork out of it. Um, that is that's just a much better uh, a, a better opportunity um, than than the molasses. Molasses might have been a good option years ago, but like a lot of things, we you know we've traded them for better things. Yeah, and I'm going to say that practically speaking, in, in today's world, there are very very few instances where fermentable carbohydrates are limiting in a silage crop. I mean, it's almost non-existent, right? I mean, they're, the only time that you might be really low in fermentable sugars is if you had a crop that was, um, uh, you know, wilted for an extremely long period of time and and respired in the field and got rained on uh, and, and then just lost all its fermentable sugars, then you might you might benefit by uh, putting on a, a little bit of sugar, but e even if you, even if you were in that situation, you know, in today's world again, where you see us moving away from small farms, um, able to put on a, a, a an additive like molasses, add a blower to an upright. How do you do that to a farm that's bringing in sixty to eighty thousand tons? <laughs> Uh, and get and <laughs> and get it, and the, the practicality of putting on two or three percent sugar and putting it on so that it's distributed evenly is is the the logistics is 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 frightening. You, yeah. You're back to you're back to get the moisture right, get the packing right, and get it covered. Right. right. Yeah. Clay, from a nutritionist perspective, can you talk a little bit about the benefits for a nutritionist and a dairy farmer for having good silage, good quality silage? What are those benefits? And then and what are some of the, the downsides 
to not having good silage and maybe uh, not have done some of the right things up front? Well, the benefits and, and you know, Lehman did a great job discussing, you know, some of this during the webinar, but but obviously, you know, if you put up poor quality silage, it, it will affect dry matter intake, right? You know, you have heating, secondary heating that's occurring. You start affecting dry matter intake. You, you will definitely affect milk production and, and other things on the farm. So you just can't make up nutritionally for, um, you know, for, for poor quality forages and anything that that will hurt dry matter intake is 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 really really going to to take a big toll um on on production it's going to it's going to raise feed costs to try to to try to compensate you know for these poor quality forages so it you know the the best thing you can do from an economic standpoint is put up as much high quality forage as possible it it just makes every life much easier on the dairy much more profitable uh, to do things right and 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 cut down on, on spoiling. Um, it improves fiber digestibility, right? Lehman, you saw that in, in some of your work, right? These um, these uh, these spoiled silages actually reduce fiber digestibility. I don't know, has that ever been shown in vivo? Um, to show that um, we can certainly show it in vitro. Yeah, we can show it in vitro uh, in vivo. Maybe not, um, but we, I mean, for sure the intake issue is, is you know, the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Buddy, I'm going to kick it back to you. Uh, you were talking a little bit before about silage additives. Is there such a thing as a best practice in terms of uh, silage additives or inoculants that you should use? Does it vary uh, depending on the conditions? Does it vary by geography? Can you just kind of walk us through a little bit of that? All of that, all of what you just said is true. Uh, it, it really comes down to uh, the management on the farm uh, and and uh, and what they're really trying to accomplish and also what their challenges are. I mean, um, in, in uh, Florida and Georgia or any of those Southern states, you're gonna have aerobic stability and, and uh, heating issues pretty much year round. Whereas in the Northern, um, in the northern states, we get about six months of the year where we don't have to worry as much. We, I, I call it the the summer um, management and then the winter management. And you know, with just as an example, with plastic, in the winter uh, we don't have to worry about the plastic as uh, as much because the snow cover or snow holds it down, um, and and we've got the temperature that is also keeping it uh, the yeast. From from growing if that if we were going to have a spoiling um, issue, whereas in the summertime everybody's got to be on on their best game. So um, yeah, it I guess there's there's probably you know five or six questions that you ask when you're trying to decide you know what inoculant um, or what additive you're going to be using, and it's you know what's the crop, what's the challenge, how well it will it get packed, uh, when will it be fed. And, and how fast are you going to feed it? I mean, those would be some of the the major questions that you would that you would end up end up asking. And I wanted to circle back to something that Clay had said. I agreed with everything, and and I just wanted to add when when forage quality gets in the way of you adding that one or two pounds or that that next point of of solids, you you don't get it you don't get it back the next time you do something right so those two pounds that you didn't get just just as an example with milk uh, but it could be two points of, of protein or two points of fat I don't get to climb that ladder again and and so when I missed it I I, I never get it back and I and I see so many farms that when they do get their silage quality right and their consistency right after a year of, of consistent forages you know, all of a sudden they're they're um, they're up two pounds, or they they've made that goal of the solids that they wanted to uh, to get to. And you ask them, well, what did you do? And sometimes it's just, gee, everything just got really consistent, and and uh, and here we are. And that makes it sound so easy, <laughs> but 
but it really is just um, doing all those little things right every day and putting one day after another. I'd say when all those things happen, that's when Clay takes uh, credit for all of it, right? As a nutritionist, right? <laughs> oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get the blame when it goes wrong, That's so you right. might as well take credit when it goes right. <laughs> Good thing. Play is fault. Yep. Uh, Lehman, um, are, are there any big uh, things that we should have covered today that we did not? I, actually, I did have, I was going to ask you a question about it because sure. I hear this occasionally um, and more so this time of year. Uh, that, gee, you know, I, I treat my haylage and I, and I know I need to treat that, but the corn silage, do I really need to treat it? That's going to ferment without me doing anything, isn't it? I mean, I, I hear, I hear that a lot and I, and I feel like we've heard that, um, for years. So I, I'd like you to, to, yeah. to tell us the story on that. So, so, you know, here's, here's the issue is corn silage and, and versus let, the two big crops. Let's focus on that, right? So corn silage versus alfalfa being a legume, right? So they differ in that um, the ease of making silage is very high for corn silage. It is very difficult to make good alfalfa silage, right? We know that because of the buffering capacity of the alfalfa. Um, and so when we look at where things need help, you know, something like corn silage, yes, corn silage in silage very quickly and probably doesn't really need that much upfront help, but where corn silage needs help is at the back end during storage and feed out because uh, corn silage is has a much higher probability of going aerobically uh, uh, in, you know, uh, spoiling aerobically at the at that back end, right? Then a legume. Now, actually, that question had come up, came up in um, the previous webinar. You know, why is it that alfalfa haylages appear uh, to be more stable than corn silages? And that's a very good question. And I, I think I probably didn't answer that really well in the in the webinar. But um, you know, muck for years um, and others like myself have have tried to understand why there's that kind of subtle difference between stability between legumes and corn silage. And to, I can tell you that from a research standpoint, there is no one specific, one or two specific things that I can tell you that are really responsible for those differences. Muck and, and some of his colleagues tried to look for those differences and were unable to identify what specifically caused those that stability difference between a legume and an alpha and a corn silage, but we know that it's there. It's not to say that legumes don't ever heat because we know they do, they do but they just tend to be more stable than corn silage. And us, and and if you just lump all the corn crops together, whether it's earlage, snaplage, you know, uh, ground shelled corn, um, high moisture anyway, and corn silage, all those crops have this really high propensity to spoil aerobically if they're exposed to air. And so those crops, the, the corn crops, need help with the Buchneri type products that are making antifungal compounds like acetic acid, right? It could be Buchneri. The newer heterolactics include Hilgardii. They might include Dialavorans. And they're usually coupled with a homolactic. But, but really, the, 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 the big guns are coming from these heterolactics, the Buchneri, the Dialavorans, and the Hilgardii. They're the ones that are making the acetic to keep the wild yeast population down low. The, book, the uh, legume products, uh, when you compare them to uh, uh, corn, they need most of their help up front during fermentation because fermentation is slow. So they really can benefit with the classical homolactic organisms like Pediococcus, uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, Lactobacillus casei, those types of bugs where you're really going to drop the pH more quickly, uh, make a more efficient fermentation, save a little dry matter, save a little bit of energy up front. Um, now, the back end for legumes, if you're on the dry side, then those legumes could also probably benefit 
from a combo with the heterolactics because dry legumes are going to have a higher propensity to go aerobically unstable as well because the packing density is poor. Where you don't need the heterolactics like buchneri is in really, really wet crops. You don't want to, if you've got a crop that's going up at, you know, less than 28 to 30 percent dry matter, you're probably not going to benefit from a, adding a buchneri or a dialyl orange type product. Um, you just don't need it there. Those crops are going to naturally ferment wild acetic at a level high enough that you're going to have kind of natural inhibition of some of these wild yeast populations. Um, so the bottom line here is, bottom line for me for corn crops is combo product with the buchneri heterolactic type products. And then for the legumes, if you're really wet on the wet side, homolactic. If you're on the real dry side, the combo with homolactic and uh, the heterolactics. You want to, anything else, Bonnie? I, I was just going to add that uh, I think uh, the heterolactics uh, originally got a, maybe a bad name, but it, again, that was historic uh, because when they first came out, uh, they were, they were as inoculants all by themselves. They didn't have the the pediococcus or the plantarum. And, and so there was a little bit of a, a loss of dry matter in the, in the initial fermentation, um, even though you save way more um, at, at feed out. But I, I don't see uh, straight uh, buchneri products or, or those heterolactics by themselves anymore. I think in the marketplace, um, the combination product is 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 the one that's being yeah. you know sold for for corn silage and for haylage yeah i think for high moisture corn you might you might see some straight buchneri type products yep, you could from... do that for yeah. yeah 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 i wouldn't disagree with yeah with that yeah. for high moisture corn yeah so how, right, how, how okay go ahead go ahead lehman see what you so, got yeah so bonnie how, how important is it to for farmers to uh, prepare for inoculation with, in terms of water quality setup, uh, cleanliness of the tanks, where the tank's going to be. Uh, do you want to maybe comment on that? Because I, I see that as a, a really big issue in a lot of farms where people just kind of, it's almost like they're treating it like bad milk replacer or something you know just i'm just gonna throw <laughs> throw this stuff in that bucket and mix it up and it's supposed to work right <laughs> there you go yeah why wouldn't it <laughs> so i think the biggest thing is that everybody you know thinks right away about this is a live organism and so i i have to treat it I have to treat it like it's a live organism. And number one, if I want to kill bacteria, what do I do? I put them in hot water or <laughs> I put them in extreme temperatures. So right from the beginning, um, and there's different uh, manufacturers, uh, but follow their recommendations. So um, some need to be refrigerated, some need to be in a cool, dry place, but follow those directions right from the beginning. Don't leave them in the in the back seat of the the truck, or or my favorite is the dash of the truck, um, where you know you can you can fry an egg by by noon. Um, so that would be number one. Number two is the 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 water needs to be uh, potable water. Um, I, again, there might be individual manufacturers that have a different um, a, a, a different protocol. But most of the ones that I've worked with, it's it's potable water, um, something that you would would drink yourself, and and then um, also look at the the label as to how long the bacteria is going to survive in in that cool water. Most of the the research that Lehman did a few years ago, um, I think you had it at 85 degrees uh, for a period of time, and and we lost. Uh, quite a few um, bacteria, like the the shelf life went down like half. Was it uh, ninety five? Higher than ninety five is, is higher is than ninety five. Okay, yeah. so so again, if you're the the insulated coolers or now the the choppers are also having their their insulated 
um, tanks on there, not the big ones by the by the engine, but the the smaller ones that are about um, 10 gallons. Um, those uh, will keep that water away from that 95 degrees and and will keep those bacteria alive. You think about it this way. You don't want your bacteria arriving onto the plant where you want to make lots of acid very quickly, feeling like it's half dead. You want it to be a, a, a robust bacteria that's ready to take sugars and make acid um, and 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 do its thing and and not be near death or or dying when it gets there. So cold water, keep it cool, um, get them on there. Again, different manufacturers might have, um, you know, that you have to use it in 24 hours or 48 hours, but, but uh, you know, listen to your, your uh, rep, listen to your manufacturer's directions. Um, the swag isn't as good um, on, on bacteria. You really want to be, you know, doing what, what they, what they're recommending. Hmm. Uh, oh, and they don't, they don't travel. Wherever they get sprayed on or land, that's where they're going to hang out. They they aren't walking to California. They aren't walking, you know, to the other side of the bunk because you didn't you didn't you didn't get it on that load. Um, yeah, every load, every ton, every pound um, has to get applied correctly because otherwise, we get like, huh? I wonder why that didn't work. And and uh, usually my first question is, well, did we really apply it, you know, the way it was supposed to be, and uh, and and did it really get applied on every load? Because sometimes it's surprising. You, I'm sure you guys have this in nutrition too, that when they mixed up a, enough for you know uh, for 500 ton that day, it came out to be exactly 499 tons before they ran out. You know, just perfect. <laughs> I'm like, wow. My my cookies never come out to be equal dozen. <laughs> but that's because somebody's eating them as they're getting baked. But that's a whole other different story. <laughs> well, listen, folks, I told you in the beginning I was having a bourbon in my glass. What I didn't tell you is this also is an hourglass. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, it takes about an hour to empty it. So as, as I see it, we've got two choices. One. We can uh, we can call quits now or two. I can go get another drink. And we can go for another hour. So it's kind of <laughs> up to you guys. <laughs> uh, listen, this has been a great conversation. You guys have been uh, great guests. I've learned a lot. It's been very entertaining. What I'd like to do is kind of close us out with just a question from each of you. And I'm going to start with Dr. Zimmerman. Dr. Zimmerman, from a nutritionist perspective, what are a couple of things you'd like to leave with our audience tonight? Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen. NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash NitroSure. Um, when it comes to putting up you know, good quality forage. We're at corn silage harvest now. You only have one chance to get it right for the year, right? So make sure you do it right. <laughs> so do, we need to do everything we can to help our clients uh, put up put up good quality silage. Yeah, thank you for that, Clay. Bonnie, been a great guest, uh, uh, a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure that we've got uh, people out there that's going to want to hear from you. What we're going to do is we're going to put your contact information in the show notes, if that's all right. And uh, yeah, and with that, I'd, I'd like you to kind of share a couple key takeaways for the audience as well. Uh, so I'm going to say two things. One is, as you're planning your silage harvest, uh, don't make it too complicated. Focus on one or two, maybe three things that are key to you having quality silage this year, and then you know inform and empower uh, your your workforce. So that they that they can help you accomplish that and do it safely. Uh, we didn't get a chance to we didn't go in that direction. I think Lehman mentioned um, it at, at one point in time, but but again, we do lots of dangerous things every day and nothing bad happened. And that doesn't make it any less safe. It just means that we have to do things um, 
consciously and and as safe as well safe safely um and and uh don't take shortcuts because we want all of you to be around next year too mm. yeah great point bonnie yeah yeah. Lehman, uh, my entire career, you've been the silage guru. Uh, you're now retired. I'm kind of curious. Have you passed the baton to anyone? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> um, yeah, there's very few people left doing silage research. Um, but uh, there's there are people in the wings that are waiting that are doing some really good research. And uh they just actually had the International Silage Conference in uh, China uh, in early August. And I'll just uh, do a shameless plug that actually the next International Silage Conference is scheduled for July 21st to 24th, 2025 in Gainesville, Florida. Okay. Wow. So it's going to be in the U.S., yeah, so you don't have yeah. to, everybody in the U.S. won't have to travel abroad. Um, so put mark that on your calendar. And there actually is an ISC 2025 website that is up and running. And there's a um, barcode that you can take a picture of and get put on the uh, email list to get uh, updates on the conference. So that's coming up really soon. It's sooner Great. than you know, than you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for that uh, that plug. And also wanted to tell you that we've got a, an awful lot of young people that listen to the podcast, a lot of students. So I want to tell them there is there's a there's a gap there. There's an opportunity if you want to be the next yeah. uh, Dr. Kong. Uh, <laughs> there's an opportunity for you. Uh, Lehman, uh, as our primary guest, is there any any final uh, key takeaway messages you'd like to leave for our audience? Um, you know, I, I guess to me, one of the most important things is not specific in terms of, you know, pack, do this packing and density and chop length. It's more global. And that is to, you know, make use of the resources that are out there, like this podcast, like Valchem, like Bonnie Kowalki, like Clay, the nutritionist. We're all here to help you. And, you know, we're, you know, use us, please. If you have questions, uh, you need help, we're here to help you for sure. Yeah, thank you for that, Lehman. Uh, well said. Lehman, Bonnie, Clay, thank you guys for joining us tonight. This has been uh, an inspiring uh, conversation. I've appreciated it. Uh, to our loyal listeners, thank you very much for joining us once again. Uh, we always uh, enjoy having you here. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at valchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.